because you're our father. You're our dad, and you, uh, you care for us. You're personally interested in our life, and we thank you for blessing us, and we give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen? So we're going to expect some good things.
is Eggimo, more than Eggimo, we sing hallelujah, praises to the King. And now to Him be the glory, all the glory, we sing hallelujah, forever and amen. thank you, God, for this night. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in your house again. Lord, it's a privilege, and we are thankful and grateful for that, Father God. You are good, Lord. You are a faithful, God. And uh, even though there's days where we may feel like we're going through the mud and we're just not moving forward, God, we know that if we look to you, then we'll never be ashamed, God, and that you are faithful in every area of our lives. We thank you, Lord. And I 
is better than you. Oh, we know it's true. You were the redeemed of the Lord. Glory to God. Redeemed from the hand of the enemy. I believe the Spirit of the Lord is saying tonight, do not lose sight of my Holy Spirit power. Do not lose sight of the healing power that is available to you. 
Do not lose sight of my love for you. Do not lose sight of my compassion for my people. Do not lose sight of the fact that I watch over my word to perform it. So let my word come out of your mouth. Speak that word and power will be released on your behalf and miracles will be prevalent. Praise God. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Woo! Glory to God. Somebody said one time, GPS means go preach somewhere. <laughs> How many believe you ought to do that? Huh? Everywhere you can. Everything that moves. Preach to it. The gospel of peace. Glory to God. I'm glad I'm in the house of the Lord tonight. How about you? Amen. Give someone a fuss bump and tell them Jesus loves you tonight. Glory to God. Well, thank you for your offering on Sunday. $350 came in. Well, actually, it wasn't, I think it was 321 for camp, uh, for Pine Valley Camp. And we added to it, so we sent them a check for $350. Thank you. That's going to bless a lot of young kids who wanted to come to camp this summer. Hallelujah. Thank God for you. And as we think about our offering, I was thinking about Acts chapter 27 and 28, you know, the Apostle Paul was on that boat, shipwreck, you remember that? And he went to the island, floated on a piece of wood to the island of Malta. I guess in the Bible it calls it Melita, but there really is an island of Malta there in the Mediterranean. And anyhow, uh, huge miracles took place. You know, Paul put his hand in the wood pile there and a viper bit him on the hand, poisonous viper. He shook it off. People were looking for him to die. He shook it off and just kept on going and was healed totally. And because of that miracle, the captain of that island, the governor of that island got saved. People got healed, and there was a revival. They asked Paul to stay, and they had a huge revival that took place on that island of Malta. And their response to it was that they presented many gifts to them before they sailed. Before Paul, you know, they got another boat and they were going to sail off. They put on board our ship everything we needed. They, in other words, it says they supplied us with everything needed for our trip. Out of what? Out of appreciation for what God had done, you know? And so. Is that another place it says they loaded us with presents. <laughs> they were on Malta for three months. This is a three-month revival. Started off with a shipwreck and turned into a three-month revival. Another place it says they outfitted, they outfitted them for the rest of their journey. In the Greek it said they heaped a full load and gave us everything we needed. They loaded their ship. So out of appreciation, you know, we can do the same thing, can't we? As we give tonight, we're giving out of appreciation to God for all that he's done. Hallelujah. So let's go ahead and give tonight. And everybody say, for the Lord is good and his mercy endures forever. Glory to God. So don't forget our picnic coming up, with our end of summer picnic, September the 10th. And don't forget our men's breakfast on the 26th. Pastor Gail told you about that. Listen, we want that to be an outreach. We want to bring souls to the kingdom. So you guys get busy, and gals too. You can let people know about it, your friends. Guys come out. And, uh, we want to see this community. We, we're not looking, we don't want people from other churches. We want the unsaved, all right? We want to bring them to this meeting, this men's breakfast. It's going to be a good one. We're going to have pavilions, so. Please get the word out. We're going to have a big sign out there that will tell us about the, tell the public about it. So, you ready to give tonight? Let's go ahead and sow into the kingdom to advance the work of God. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Oh, they're coming back here. Did you hear about this? A woman walked up to the manager of a department store and said, are you hiring any help? No, that's the wrong, that's the wrong joke. Forget that one. I didn't think that one was so good. All right, here, let's try this one. <laughs> There was a guy telling his friend that he and his wife had a serious argument the night before, but it ended. He 
he said, when she came crawling to me on her hands and knees. What did she say? asked the friend. The husband replied, she said, come out from under that bed, you coward. <laughs> on her hands and knees, okay. Everybody go, ha, ha. <laughs> Either that or throw the bum out, huh? Anyhow, let's go ahead and pray tonight. Brother James. Okay, Lord, we just thank you for your offerings. You have some your glory and spread the goodness of the gospel. Let's give together your life in Jesus' name. Amen. Aren't you appreciative for Matt Pluto and working with our worship team? Come on, let's give him a great big hand. Thanks. Thank you, brother. Father, thank you for your anointing pouring over here to bring restoration and healing, deliverance, and Father, that from all the past hurts, we ask God that you heal them. You are the hurt healer, Lord. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Everybody say, he's the hurt healer. Have you ever hurt in life? He's the hurt healer. And by the way, Get, get you one of these out there. We have these. Uh, I can find where it is. Everyone's been hurt in life. Myself included. Everybody has at some point or another. I'm going to tell you, this little prayer is wonderful because it will, as you pray this prayer, it will cause the hurt of life to be alleviated Amen. and dissipated. It's all about Jesus who is the hurt healer. Now, I'm a firm believer that in Mark 11, 24, what things do you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. So you pray for something one time and believe that you receive it. But this particular prayer, I believe it is almost like an intercession prayer, something that you can pray every single day and stand in faith and believe for God to alleviate the pain of your past hurts. So be sure to get, I think we have some out there, don't we, Bob, out on the, uh, well, you could check if you would. Uh, I think they're out there in the, the uh, welcome center, so be sure to get one of these, and that'll be a blessing to you, all right? Jesus, the hurt healer. Hallelujah. He went to the cross and died for our sins to heal our body and also to heal us of the hurts of life. He doesn't want you to have to deal with that. Mm -mm. He wants to make the whole man whole. He wants to heal you. He wants to heal your emotions. He wants to heal every facet of your being. Because he loves you. Because of his compassion toward his people. Glory to God. I'm going to switch over, Paul, to this one. Glory to God. 
Well, maybe I'll give you one more joke since the last one wasn't too, too hot. <laughs> In fact, this guy's name's Paul. Paul got a part-time job at the post office, and the first assignment his supervisor gave him was a job of sorting mail. Paul separated the letters so fast that his motions were literally a blur. <laughs> okay. Extremely pleased by this, the supervisor approached Paul at the end of the first day. He says, I just want you to know, the supervisor said, that I'm very pleased with your job that you did today. You're one of the fastest workers we've ever had. Well, thank you, sir, said Paul, beaming. And tomorrow I'll do even better. I'll try to do even better. Better, the supervisor asked with astonishment. How, how can you possibly do any better than you did today? Paul replied, tomorrow I'm going to read the addresses. <laughs> Everybody say, ha, ha. <laughs> Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter 9. John chapter 9. This is about the man born blind. Father, thank you for this word tonight. And Father, we ask you to help us with it. Illuminate it in our hearts in Jesus' name. John chapter 9, verse 1, And Jesus passed by, he saw a man which was blind from his birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Master, who did sin, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither hath this man sinned, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me, while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. Now I want you to do something here when you read this. You know, the, the scripture isn't written originally in the Greek. It wasn't written in chapter and verse. There were no punctu punctuations at all. That was just put in by the discretion of the translators. So I believe it needs to be, read, it needs to be written or read this way according to the Greek. Neither hath this man sinned nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. I must work the works of him that sent me. In other words, so that the works of God might be manifested in this man, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. And as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And so I'm going to shift over to the New Living Translation here beginning with verse 6. Then he spit on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes. Now, there were some unique ways that Jesus healed people. And I've heard of people going to hear an evangelist or a healing preacher, and maybe they'll slap him or something, and you think, wow. But he gets results. You know, maybe kind of punch him in the stomach and they had a tumor and the tumor goes away <laughs> and they're totally healed of cancer so I'm not going to punch anybody so don't worry about it but anyhow <laughs> how many believe he was the son of God he did it the right way <laughs> he, he said he only said the things that his father wanted him to say and he did the things that his father wanted him to do so he made mud Smoothed the mud over the blind man's eyes, and he told him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Kind of reminds me of the Gadarene, the man who was a maniac, who was, had chains on him and ran in the tombs and screaming and yelling and everything. And Jesus crossed the, the lake, and he went there for him only and laid hands on him, cast the devil out of him. And the next thing you know, the Bible says concerning the Gadarene that they saw him sitting, clothed, and in his right mind. That's what Jesus does. He was sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And this man who was born blind, we're going to see what happens to him. When Jesus put mud on him, it says, so the man went and washed and came back seeing. His neighbors and others who knew him as a blind beggar asked each other, Is this the man, that, that beggar? Some said he was, and others said no, but he surely looks like him. And the beggar kept saying, I am the same man 
They asked, well, who healed you? What happened? He told them, the man they called Jesus made mud and smoothed it over my eyes and told me, go to the pool of Siloam and wash off the mud. I went and washed, and now I can see. Where is he now, they asked. I don't know, he replied. Then they took the man to the Pharisees. Now, as it happened, Jesus had healed the man on a Sabbath. And the Pharisees asked the man all about it, so he told them, and he smoothed the mud over my eyes, and when it was washed away, I could see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man, Jesus, is not from God, for he is working on the Sabbath. You think healing somebody, does that really work? <laughs> the Jews, the legalistic Jews thought so. Others said, but how could he, an ordinary sinner, do miracles and sign, miraculous signs? So there was a deep division of opinion among them. Then the Pharisees once again questioned the man who had been blind and demanded, this man who opened your eyes, who do you say he is? So the blind man replies, I think he must be a prophet. <laughs> the Jewish leaders wouldn't believe he had been blind. So they called in his parents and they asked him, is this your son? Was he born blind? If so, how can he see? His parents replied, we know this is our son and that he was born blind. But we don't know how he can see or who healed him. He is old enough to speak for himself. Ask him. Now here... Now, just think about that for a minute. He was born blind, never saw an image, never saw a person, never saw a table of food, never from birth. And suddenly, he can see because of Jesus. So ask him, they said, this because, we, because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders who had announced that anyone saying Jesus was the Messiah would be expelled from the synagogue. That's why they said, he is old enough to speak for himself, ask him. So for the second time, they called in the man who had been blind and told him, give God glory by telling the truth, because we know Jesus is a sinner. Here's what he says. <coughs> he says, I don't know whether he's a sinner, the man replied, but I know this. I was blind and now I see. Glory to God. I was blind, but now I see. A lot of us were spiritually blind, and now we see. But Jesus, when you think about it, some say, well, Jesus is a prophet, and Muhammad is a prophet, and in Hinduism, that's prophetic or what have you. So aren't all, all prophets just the same? No. <laughs> Jesus, in fact, go with me to Matthew chapter 11. Do you remember whenever John the Baptist sent a message to Jesus and say, are you the one that we're looking for? In Matthew chapter 11 and verse 3, he sends a message with his two disciples and he said in verse 3, and he said, aren't thou he that should come or do we look for another? In other words, are you the Messiah or is there somebody else? Jesus answered and said unto him, Go show again those things which you do hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, and the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever is, shall not be offended in me. So what was he saying? He was saying, because of the miracles that he did, he is who he said he was. He is the prophet of God that was sent. Now, all these other prophets that I just mentioned, Muhammad and... Uh, the, I'm, I'm telling you, you can't go into a, 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 a mosque and find a miracle. You cannot go into a Hindu temple and get a miracle. You can't go into... Uh, any of these places and get a miracle because they don't do miracles and they're not alive. But Jesus does miracles and that's the profound difference between him and all of the others. He is a miracle working Jesus. Do you 
Believe that today. He said, told John, the blind see, the deaf hear, the crippled walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead are raised. So, yeah, you can't go into a Hindu sh shrine and get a miracle. The one thing that separates him from all the other prophets is the miraculous. He is deity. Now, it's true that people believe because of these miracles. If you look at John chapter 6, go there with me, John chapter 6 and verse 2. This is what opened their eyes. This is what arrested their attention. This is what showed them that he was the Messiah. John chapter 6 and verse 2 says, And great multitudes followed him. Why? Because they saw his miracles which he did on them that were diseased. Go down there to verse 14. And right after, this is right after he did the miracle for the five loaves and the two fishes and fed the 5,000. It says in verse 14, Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, This is of a truth, that prophet that should come into the world. See, they believed because of what he did. Look at uh, John 2, 11. Go back to the miracle of the changing the water into wine. And the Bible says this is the beginning of miracles. In other words, he just began them then. He, he had hope a whole bunch more that he did, didn't he? John 2.11 says, <coughs> This beginning of miracles did Jesus in G Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory when he changed the water into wine. By the way, I heard something the other day. People get into debates over the wine. I think it was maybe Jerry Savelle that, that taught, you know, the, in order to ferment wine, get the sugar to ferment in wine, it takes at least three weeks, perhaps even six and a half weeks, and in some cases, two or three years. So in this miracle, they drank the wine immediately. It wasn't fermented. Can you shout amen? amen. Well, I don't know if that pleases you or not, but <laughs> anyhow... So, here in John 2, 11, he, this is the beginning of miracles, isn't it? Isn't that what, what I just read? Yeah, yeah, 2, 11. Yeah, this is the beginning of miracles. And what is the result of it? His, his disciples believed on him. Go to John chapter 12. So, forget that argument about, well, you know, it's, it's intoxicating. No, it wasn't. Not in this particular instance. They didn't even have time to ferment. Does everybody follow what I'm saying there? Got that? Okay. Now, John 12, 18 says, well, verse 17, The people, therefore, that was with him when he called Lazarus out of his grave and pray, raised him from the dead, bear record. For this cause the people also met him, for that they had heard that he had done this miracle. People wanted to come and see him. Because he was a miracle worker. They'd heard about what he had done in raising Lazarus from the dead. How about John 2.23? Look at this one. John 2.23. And Vienna's doing a great job back there getting the scriptures up for us. Everybody say, yay, Vienna. Yeah, Vienna. John 2.23 and now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name. When? When they saw the miracles which he did. So, the miracles actually arrested people's attention. And caused them to believe. Didn't it? Absolutely. And so the th same thing with the man born blind. And... Uh, what a transformation. In fact, go back to John chapter 9 a minute. And let's look at verse 4. John 9 verse 4, where it says, I must work the works of him that sent me. Now, do you know in the Greek, the word I there really means we. We must work the works of him that sent him, sent us. We, corporately. Because we're to do the works of Jesus, John 14, 12, aren't we? We're to do what he did. We're to imitate him. 
were to go about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. And the Bible says in Daniel eleven thirty two, those who they who know their God will be strong and do exploits. Praise God, Hallelujah. Uh, Luke Luke uh, nineteen thirteen. Let's go there. Luke nineteen thirteen. Boy, don't you love His Word? Luke nineteen and thirteen. Notice what it says here. Luke 19, 13. And he called his ten servants to, and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy. Does that mean just occupy space? No. No, we get the word occupation or vocation from this word, occupy. We're to do the great commission. We're to be about our Father's business. I must work the works of Him that sent me while it is still day. For the night comes when no man can work. And so we're to occupy or carry out His will in the earth, which is to set the captives free. Do what He did. Amen. Till He comes back. Talk to your friends. Talk to your relatives. Talk to your co-workers. You have the words of life, priceless words of life that will break bondages and cause people to be liberated. Amen. Glory to God. You have this yoke destroying, burden removing, anointing. Because Jesus said, all power in heaven and earth is given unto me. And then he said, go you into all the earth. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. So that means because he's the head and you're the body and you're connected to him. He wants you to go forth with his power. All power, he said, in heaven and earth. All power in heaven and earth. All authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me, Jesus said. Now go you into the earth and preach the gospel. Why? Because you're the salt and the light. You know, they, they questioned Jesus too. The Pharisees and the religious people said, who, who do you think you are, basically? I think over there in John 10, 33, that's basically what they were saying. John 10, 33, it says, the Jews answered him, saying, for a good work we stone thee, but for blasphemy, or we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, thou being a man, makest thyself God. Well, he was God. He is God. He is deity. And I got a whole bunch of scriptures to, to prove that, if you... You know, want to call me, I'll give them to you. <laughs> but he is deity. He is God. And people will say to you, if you're trying to lay hands on the sick or try to perform miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit, they're going to say, well, who do you think you are? And you can tell them how much time you have. I'll tell you. <laughs> I'm an ambassador for Jesus. I'm a representative of heaven. Amen. I'm salt and I'm light. I am his, his hands and feet in the earth. I am anointed of God. I have an anointing according to 1 John chapter 2, verse 20 and 27. Anointed of the Holy Spirit to do the works of Jesus. Not to glorify me, but to glorify Him. Amen? And to GPS. Go preach the, the gospel somewhere. Go preach somewhere. Right? But Jesus did many miracles. This was a big part of His ministry. And in fact, he did so many, it says in John 21, 25, go there with me, John 21, 25, it says, and there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which if I should be, if it should be written, every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Wow. You know, the miracles that he did were not just all recorded. There are many, many more that went unrecorded that Jesus did. Many, many wonderful things. And so, uh, what do we, how do we do? How do we do it? Well, back in John chapter 2, his mother said, whatever he says to do, just do it. That's what he she told the guys. You know, go fill the water pots. Whatever he said to do, do it. And so he's telling us. You know, do it quickly, 
and do it quietly. Like you tell your child, okay, now do it quickly and do it quietly. Well, he's telling us to just be obedient. Whatever he tells you to do, do it. And we know he will provide. In Genesis 22, 6, it said God will provide a lamb. That's what he said to his son, Isaac, didn't he? He said, we're going up to the mountain. And we'll, he said, the son said, well, Father, where's the sacrifice? And he didn't say, you it, boy. He just said, God will provide a sacrifice. He will provide a lamb. And how many of you know, he has been true to his word. He provided the ram in the thicket, but he also supplies for us. The Bible says he will supply all your need according to his riches in glory. That's kind of like saying he will provide a sacrifice, right? He, he will supply what you need in order to do his works. All we got to do is walk by faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7, it says walk by faith. We walk by faith and not, not by sight. Faith always believes before it exists or before we even see it, right? He commanded and it became. In fact, when he said light be, he, what, one of the things he was saying, this be, right? Light be. And it was. And so... We walk by faith and not by sight, and we expect, even though we can't see something, that it's going to come to pass, okay? Even though you don't see it with a naked eye, it's going to come to pass because God is watching over His Word to perform it. <laughs> Romans chapter 10, pardon me. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. Beginning with verse 6. You know, this is, a, this is a chapter on faith. Do you know that? Romans chapter 6, or, uh, chapter 10, verse 6. It, this is a chapter on, on faith. It says, verse 6, But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise. Now remember, there's two kinds of righteousness. One was, which was under the Old Testament by the deeds of the law. But Jesus said, Said, by the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. He says, We're only justified by faith in Jesus. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Well, he's already done that, hasn't he? Jesus has already come to the earth. Amen. And sacrificed his life. So don't ask him to do that again. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring up Christ again from the dead. Huh? No, don't, don't say that. He's already made the price. Amen. Paid the price. Verse 8. But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. It's in your mouth and it's in your heart. I said it's in your mouth and it's in your heart. Well, how does it get into my heart? By speaking it out of your mouth. The more you declare it, the more you proclaim it, the more you speak it, the more it's going to get deep down into your spirit. And it's when it becomes part of you, that's when it will work for you, when it gets, becomes deep down into your spirit like that. And so he says, that is the word of faith which we preach. Now, somebody, some may say, well, I don't think I like that word of faith. Well, wait a minute. He calls it the word of faith. In the Bible, right? It's not the word of doubt. It's the word of faith, right? <laughs> and so, over there in verse 9, here's how it works. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Well, here he tells us how to get saved. You believe it in your heart? You speak it with your mouth. You got to believe it in your heart and speak it with your mouth. What? That Jesus, you believe, was raised from the dead. Because it goes on to say then, in the next verse, it says, For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Now, do you know that word unto there in the Greek really means resulting in? salvation for with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made 
resulting in salvation. Hallelujah. So now we know you can tell people how to get saved. They got to believe it in their heart and confess it with their mouth. Anytime I do a funeral, anytime I do a wedding, I try to bring this out. This couple that's getting married gave their hearts to Jesus. There may be some of you here that don't know Jesus. And what do you need to do? Believe in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. They need to repent of their sins, but it's all part of it, right? And so, whether it's a funeral, no matter what it is, I try to get people to understand. You've got to believe in your heart and speak it with your mouth. And do you know that this is how you receive everything else from God? Not only salvation, but your healing, the baptism in the Holy Ghost, uh, your miracles, your provisional miracles, whatever it is, you believe in your heart and you speak it with your mouth. Can somebody shout amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. You say, well, how do you know that, Pastor? Well, over there in Colossians 2.6, notice what it says here in Colossians 2.6. It tells us that basically everything else works the same way, that you got saved. Colossians 2.6, it says, As ye therefore received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in Him. The same way, as you received Jesus, the same way you received Him, so walk ye in Him. And so, if you're going to believe God for a, a miracle, for, or a healing from cancer, I should say, what do you need to do? You need to believe in your heart, speak it with your mouth. Romans 4, 17, call things that be not as though they were. Father, thank you that I am the healed of the Lord. Thank you, Father, that your anointing is working in me to kill every abnormal cell and to, and to replace it with healthy, normal cells. Thank you, Father, for the, your word that says, Whatsoever, whosoever shall say unto this mountain, Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. I said, he'll have whatsoever he saith. But you got to believe it in your heart, right? Once again, it's a heart thing. You believe in your heart, you speak it with your mouth. You believe it in your heart, you speak it with your mouth. <laughs> Amen. Amen. That's how you receive everything that, that you need in the kingdom of God. Whether it's finances or healing or... or uh, Whatever, and call things that be not as though they were, right? And so, Jesus says, as you've received Jesus, so walk ye in him. In other words, do the same thing as you did when you received Jesus. Hallelujah. And so, faith calls things that be not. One translation says, things that not being as being. All right? In fact, I quoted that scripture to you. Let's, let's just go over there for a minute, and I'll close with this. Mark eleven twenty two. Mark eleven twenty two. Now, why, why, how did I shift gears and get over into faith? I don't know how I did that. But, anyway. <laughs> but we're going to need faith if we're going to GPS, go preach somewhere, right? You're going to have to preach to people and speak to them, knowing full well that the Word of God is going to produce what it's intended to produce according to Isaiah 55 11 it will accomplish what it's supposed to accomplish and so you give them the word of God you tantalize them you give them the the carrot out hold the carrot out there and they say yes I want that I want the gospel it's good news I want to be healed I want to walk in provision I want to repent of my sins I don't want to live a filthy wicked life anymore no praise God I want to live for Jesus all right how do you do that Believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. And the mouth is so important in confessing this and speaking this. Mark 11, 23, 22. Mark 11, 22. Notice what it says. And Jesus answering saith unto them, Have faith in God. There's the answer to every problem. Having faith in God. Huh? You have a relational problem? Have faith in God. You have a financial problem? Have faith in God. You, you have a bondage or some addiction. Have 
faith in God. Hey, Ben, I used to smoke cigarettes many, many years ago. And uh, it was faith in God that helped me to quit. Have faith in God. It's the answer. In fact, one translation says it this way. Have the God kind of faith. Yet another translation says this. It says, lay hold of God's faithfulness. Lay hold of God's faithfulness. Everybody say, God is faithful. So lay hold of God's faithfulness. And then it goes on to say, now how do you do this? Here's how the God kind of faith works in the very next verse. Verse 23. Whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Church, we need to believe in our heart and speak it with our mouth. Believing it in your heart is not enough. You've got to say it with your mouth. One preacher said it this way. He said, the door to the supernatural swings on two hinges. Believing and speaking. You say, well, I've been believing God for years. But, well, here's the, here's the missing link then. Just add to it your speaking. You want to get saved? For with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made, resulting in salvation. And so you could do the same thing here. Believing in your heart, speaking it with your mouth is going to result in your provisional miracle, in your financial miracle, in your uh, getting rid of a bondage in your life, or whatever it might be. Believing in your heart and releasing faith with the words of your mouth. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand. I'm not done, but we're out of time. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We're called to preach the gospel to every person that will listen. Amen. And we didn't just need to expect results. Expect that light to dispel the darkness. When you speak the word, that light's going to dispel darkness. And you know what will happen? People will do a 180 in their lives. Once they were headed toward their demise, but now they're headed for their overcoming victorious life in Jesus. How do you do it? Believe in your heart. Speak it with your mouth. Release faith with the words of your mouth. And watch it come to pass. Everybody say hallelujah. hallelujah. Glory to God. Heavenly Father, thank you so much. And those of you watching out there tonight, we pray that the Lord ministered to you, and if you would like to make him Lord of your life, once again, believe in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and let's do that right now. Everybody pray this prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Jesus, come into my heart. I repent of my sins. Be the Lord of my life. Thank you for forgiving me. Of all my past sins. Thank you for loving me. For saving me. And for a first class plan for my life. In Jesus name. Amen. Hallelujah. The Bible says the just shall live by faith. It says that four times in the Bible. The just shall live by faith. We got to stay in faith. Walk by faith. And not by sight. Have a good evening. Love you guys. Bye bye. Yeah.